I'm gonna talk about what it means to be a living stone. My message title is, I am a living stone. And you have to see that God is building you to build something. Everybody here is being built to build. The kingdom progresses and the government of God has no end because there's a constant building that takes place. People say, well, it's not about the building. Well, God has a purpose for a building. And the word building is actually in the Bible because God creates places and spaces where people can come and learn how to be wise, learn what real religious piety looks like, not false, fake religious piety. They learn how to grow in strength. They learn the spiritual disciplines, and they have a place where they come to worship and offer sacrifices to God together. In fact, everything biblically is a together. Even the Lord's Prayer starts out with our and give us. There's no me, myself, and I in the kingdom. No man's an island of themselves. All of us are designed to be fit together to build something. And the scripture makes it clear that the very first thing we do is we hook up to a cornerstone. Now, a cornerstone is the most important stone in a foundation because everything is laid from the cornerstone. All the stones are built in formation to the chief cornerstone. Let's look at the scripture. First Peter chapter 2. Verse four says that first we come to Jesus as a living stone. Let's pause right there. We conform to the cornerstone. The cornerstone doesn't conform to us. We don't don't tell God to fit into our worldview. We fit into God's perspective. We fit into God's design. So when we talk about Jesus as a cornerstone, you have to think about a design. You have to think about a foundation. You have to think about being connected to that cornerstone. So when the cornerstone is laid perfectly right, and then all the stones hook to the cornerstone, you have perfect formation. But any stone that's not hooked to the cornerstone, you might want to write this down, any stone not hooked to the cornerstone is a crooked stone. It's a crooked stone. Because it's building something on its own. So if you're not conforming to the pattern of Christ and being transformed to him, then you're building something on your own in a crooked way, and it's inevitably bound to fall. If there's any home builders here, any carpenters, anybody that does construction, you understand this. And you may not see it at first, but down the line, eventually what might only be a fingernail or the tip of my fingernail off down the line, it gets further and further and further and further and further away. It's like a crack in a foundation. Mm-hmm. If you build a house on, the crack, uh, on a cracked foundation, think about it. It may be the most little hairline fracture that could seem to not be a problem. And it's not a problem until there's a house on it. And even that house may not be the problem until a storm comes. Throw in a storm, throw in hardship, throw in broken relationships, In fact, Jesus made it explicitly clear in Matthew 7 that the storms of life beat on everybody's house. Everybody, including my own. No one is exempt from the beating of the storm. No one. But there's always a house that stands and a house that falls. And the house that fell had a cracked foundation or did not dig deep enough to get to the the rock of Christ. Remember, houses are built on rocks or they were then. Now, I'm, my house, this is funny. It's, it's hilarious to think about that our house is actually built on sand because I live in Flower Bluff, and it's all sand. But I can assure you, underneath my house, my pier and beam house, are some piers that have been there since the 40s that have never shifted. Why? Well, first off, in this area, you have very little shifting because it's sand, but second of all, it's dug deep. The premise of the scripture, when Jesus was talking about not building on sand, is a mindset of the sand of your own belief systems, the sand of things in your life that don't have stability. And what he's saying is, I'm the rock. Now, what did Jesus tell Peter when Peter got the wisdom and the revelation of who Jesus was? What did did Jesus say? He He said, what you just discovered about who I am, 
who I am and the knowledge that you have upon this rock, Jesus is talking about himself, I will build my what? Kingdom, Kingdom, church, house. I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And in fact, what that really means is you will destroy the gates of hell. So I'm not worried about the gates of hell coming against me because I know who I am and I've shut the door. Shut the door. You need to shut the flesh down. <laughs> like that, I know what y'all were thinking. Got your attention there. You gotta shut the flesh down and get built on the rock. So when we talk about being a living stone today, what we're talking about is that all of you play a part. I play a part. And I'm gonna show you from scripture how what's even more beautiful is God takes stones that were burnt down that were the walls that were fallen down and considered rubbish. And he says, oh, you're, yeah, your life may look like rubbish, but guess what? I can take your rubbish. Man, I just feel the Lord on that. You know what the word rubbish means? Useless. Good for nothing. Value, it has no value. It's been burnt down, broke down. But God takes the burnt down, broke down, weak, things of this world and turns you into something beautiful. And in this particular case, it's a living stone. But before I get to that, I want you to look at this scripture again. Rejected indeed by men. And here in a minute, it's going to say, and you also. And you also. If Jesus was rejected, you will be rejected. But here's the great thing. I learned this in sales a long time ago. That for every nine no's, all I need is one yes. If you've ever been in sales, I was a salesman in my past. The premise was never keep stopping because that one yes can turn into multiple yeses. And on one side of my life, I'm, you're going to have, or your life, you're going to have all these rejections. And on the other side, you're going to have all these acceptances. And maybe one seems larger than the other, but somehow God designs that because if Jesus was rejected, you too will be rejected. Why will you be rejected? Well, you're going to be rejected because I like this word repudiate. The word repudiate means that people will refuse to accept you or be associated with you. They're going to deny the truth and the validity of what you're standing for, and they're going to cast you off. Now, rejection is inevitable for the believer that stands on God's word. Let's just start off with the sanctity of marriage. Then let's move over to there's only two genders. If you just start with those two, the world system will reject you. And the challenge is, is if you're constantly listening to the world system and not being renewed in your mind, see Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. The world has a pattern and it wants you to conform to it. So spend a lot of time listening to the media an event and less time listening to the Lord, and it's inevitable over the course of time, suddenly the waters will get muddy, won't they? If you listen to a lie long enough, it'll become the truth to you, but it's not the truth to God. And so Jesus was rejected because he took a stand. If you take a stand, you are going to be offensive. But if you're offended by perfect love, be offended away. <laughs> Understand? If you're affected by God's design, see, I understand the design and purpose of marriage and family and children. I understand why God did the things the way that he did. So rejection is going to be inevitable. Jesus was rejected by God, but guess what? I'm sorry, he was rejected by men, but guess what? He was accepted by God. What would you rather be? Right, but a lot of people want to be accepted by men and could care less if they're accepted by God. But what I want to say, if your concern is to be accepted by men, you'll be rejected by God. Nobody wants to believe that, but that's true. And it's biblical. So I'd rather be accepted by God and rejected by men. In fact, rejections, I'm telling you, it's inevitable. And the more you get rejected and the more you take a stand, the thicker your skin gets and the more you're like, well, if God is for me, then I don't care. It's a paraphrase. Here's the real scripture. If God is for you, who can be against you? 
My paraphrase is, if God is for me, then you know what? I already know people will be against me. And so I take a stand. Jesus already drew the line in the sand. I just want you all to know. I don't even have to actually redraw the line. I just have to stand firm. And if I can get a body and churches in the city united, and it's not my sole responsibility, but this is happening in Corpus Christi. If that can happen, guess what? Then suddenly thousands and thousands and thousands of people are standing for biblical truth, religious liberty, and the, the constitutional values of our nation. So I'm just going to focus on Nueces County. I can't not because I care deeply about the generations to come. I'm thinking two, three, four, five generations from now. I'm thinking about long when I'm gone because if things don't shift and this nation keeps moving in the direction that it's moving and we don't get believers that stand up with the power and the government of God, not just a bunch of talking heads, but people with authority that have healthy marriages and men that aren't hooked on porn. I mean, we can just start in those few spots and we get kids that aren't fatherless I'll just take some small wins. I'll just take some small wins. How about y'all? So I want you to see this. We come to Jesus as a, who is the living stone. Why is Jesus a living stone? Because he resurrected. What's different between Jesus and every other religion of the world? And I can assure you, if they think their God's alive, it's a demon. I'm just telling you right now. And in fact, the definition of idol in the Bible is a dumb thing. That's what it means. It's dumb. <laughs> it really does mean that. Like, I'm not just making that up. Like, if you look up idol, it means dumb. Why? Because it doesn't talk. It doesn't speak. And if you think an idol is speaking, it is a demon. I'm just telling you. I've seen it personally. Now, once you see this word precious, Precious means valuable, honorable, highly esteemed in reputation than all others. It's a precious stone. But precious stones go through something to become that. Come on. Precious stones were formed with high pressure. They were being built long before you saw it in the ground, surrounded by coal and dirt and the pressure of the elements. Yeah. Right. Right. So God uses the pressure of the elements of this world and even nature, like hurricanes. He uses people that persecute us to actually make us. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. So instead of fighting back with the way the world fights, you fight differently. Let's say I fight differently. I fight you can't fight. I don't expect the world to think the way that I think. But when they don't think the way that I think, I want to show them what the truth is. Because I know the truth. They don't like that because they think there's a lot of truths. But there's only one way, there's only one truth, and there's only one life, and his name is Jesus Christ. So Jesus is a living stone, yes, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and he's very precious. Now I want you to just see the first two words of verse five. Verse five says, let's just say it out loud. Say, me also. me also. I mean, that's not that complicated. If he was, you will. But see, if you want to be PC, politically correct, or worse than that is RC, not RC. <laughs> not our RC. Which is religiously correct. I'm, we're not religiously correct. Were Jesus correct? Yeah. And the world's not going to understand it. And they're not going to like it. Yeah, we're JC correct. Thank you. You know my statement. I'm not politically correct. I'm not religiously correct. I'm kingdom correct. And so us also as what? To be a living stone means that we were all once a dead stone. Now, you don't have to have done drugs and been in prison and been through all the stuff I've been through to need Jesus as much as I do. Amen. My wife's never done a drug in her life. 
And I don't think she's ever been in trouble. <laughs> okay. Oh, she says she's been in trouble. I just don't know when. But the point is that she needed the Lord as much as I did. And even King David said, behold, I was conceived in iniquity. So everybody was once a dead stone. I want to take a minute to talk about a dead stone. In order to understand a living stone, we have to take a look at a dead stone. A dead stone is this mindset and understanding that it has no life. See, the word living is the word zao, Z-A-O, and what it means, it means lively and animated and efficacious. Now, that's a big word for some of you that maybe only a pharmacist would understand, efficacy. But what it means is that, it, that once you become a living stone, what you were intended to do and become happens. It's so the, the word efficacy is often used in taking a medication. So when you take a pill, what's the efficacy rate? Meaning how well does it do what it's supposed to do inside of you? And when you're hooked to the cornerstone, you become a living stone now, and in turn you become efficacious or contagious. I'd much rather, I would much rather be contagious in this day and age with Jesus than anything else. And when the world's telling everybody they're contagious, I'm like, you know what? You can call me contagious. You get around me, there's going to be some Holy Ghost fire coming into you. That's, or you're not going to like me and reject me. And at some point, I, you just live in the tension. Reject, accept. It's like, okay, it is what it is. It is what it is. And so when we come to Jesus, we become a living stone. Why? You have to ask yourself, what am I a living stone for? Well, let's look at the scripture. To be built up, we're going to talk about that, into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So God picks you. He chooses you. He ordains you or appoints you for a purpose. When you give your life to Christ, you're given yourself to a purpose. You're enlisting in an army. You are a, you're being built and you are building. We go from dead to being resurrected. And so the dead stone, these are stones that are disconnected from the rock or disconnected to the cornerstone. Or maybe they were thwarted in their purpose by being burnt down and turned into rubbish. And now it seems like your waste material that's considered unimportant, useless, or valueless. I'm sure that that's what everybody thought in Decapolis about the demoniac who was chained up in caves, cutting himself, and Jesus shows up, the demons manifest. What I love about that story is I don't go hunting for demons. I just stay in the pocket of his love and his power, and the demons, they find me. <laughs> and then I say, come out. And then I move on. I don't have to brag about it, but casting out demons should be normal for a Christian. And you say, well, where are they at? Well, they're all around. All you got to do is get in where Jesus is, follow him, stay in the pocket, stay hooked to the vine, and he'll do the rest. So we're like, man, I've never seen one come out of someone. Well, <laughs> stick around, <laughs> stick around. So a dead stone. I want to talk about burnt down broken stones and how God uses rubbish as building material. Can anybody guess the story that I'm going to talk about? Nehemiah. Okay. Now, Nehemiah is an incredible story. Israel is sold into Persia or Babylon or modern day Iran. It's modern day Iran today. And because of harlotry, because of uh, prostituting themselves, idol worship, constant rebellion, they got themselves sold into slavery. They got themselves sold into Babylon. And then we find a Hebrew guy by the name of Nehemiah who's a cupbearer to the king. He makes sure that the wine that the king drinks is not poisoned. That sounds like a pretty cool job. I <laughs> hope... Let's go to the next. Let's move on. 
We're going to talk about stones that were burnt down and became the rubbish to build a wall. And I'd like to thank Nathan Harden for my next comment. Oh, no. <laughs> I was once living stoned. <laughs> but now I'm a living stone. There you go. How do you like that right there? <laughs> yeah. I think it's awesome. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter one. One of the brethren of Nehemiah, a guy by the name of Hanani, comes up to, right off the bat, comes up to Nehemiah and says to him, verse three, the survivors who were left from the captivity in the province, so there was a remnant there, are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So the first thing is, is it was in his heart to do what he was about to do. It broke him. And for me, when I see the state of Christianity and even the world around us, it breaks my heart. And I can't not do something about it. Now we had a choice and everybody has a choice. God gives everybody a choice. But Amber and I realized we couldn't stay living in our beach house and living lives unto ourselves. We had to answer the call because we would have been more miserable not doing what God called us to do. And God will put a burden inside of every one of you. It may be for teenagers. It may be for worship or music. It may be for children. The list goes on, but all of us should be carrying a burden, and that burden produces something inside of us. If you don't care about the burden, then something's amiss with Jesus inside of you. Well, nothing's amiss with him. It's more amiss with your perception and understanding of him, because once Jesus comes in you, you get a burden. You get set free to set others free. You get set free to do something with the gifts and talents that God has given you. Let's switch over to Nehemiah chapter two, verse three. What happens is, I'm gonna paraphrase it for you. The king, Nehemiah goes to serve the king, Artaxerxes, and he says, dude, what's up with your face? <laughs> now, it doesn't say it like that, but he could see in his face, his countenance was downcast. Your face don't lie, right? Right? And so Nehemiah comes to the king, and, he's, and he had just prayed this prayer. All of chapter one goes on to Nehemiah saying, please, God, have mercy. Yes. Bring restoration. Yes. He first prays. Yes. That's why the intercessors in this church are so important. I want to thank everybody that prays, that comes on Wednesdays in pre-service prayer and on the other Saturdays that pray because there's an anointing of the presence of God in this place, and that comes from people that prepare and pray and cry out. Prayer is the backbone Prayer and worship is the backbone of this church and where we're going to go. So Nehemiah was an intercessor. Nehemiah prayed. And so he comes for the king, and he's got a sad face. And he said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city and the place of my father's Tombs lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. And so the, the king says, well, he's had a few glasses of wine. It was a good time for Nehemiah to bring this up. Let's read the story. Yeah. And the king says, well, what can I do for you? And he says, well, I'm glad you asked. He says, I want you to write a letter to all the governors and the rulers in that region. And by the way, I'm going to need timber. I need to build the house. I'm going to need a letter to get some wood from some neighboring countries. I'm going to need some money, and I probably need a little mini army. So Artaxerxes would ultimately send captains and horses and horsemen to accompany one guy. Mm -hmm. So God would influence the heart of the Persian-Iranian king. This is just so cool. Right, I think about uh, Joseph all the time. God would take a young dream dreamer sold into slavery and put him in charge of all of Egypt's economy. Right. How does that work? Right. <laughs> I mean, think about it. 
God can do the most incredible things with your life. So what happens? Right off the bat, he goes to Samballot. And when Samballot, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonites, see the Ammonites, the enemies of Israel had now moved into the territory of Judah and Samaria. And so now when Nehemiah shows up and presents the letter, it says when the officials heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. I want to say a couple of things on this point. Number one, there should be a heart inside of you for the well-being of God's people and for this nation. Yeah. God always tells you to pray for peace in the place that he puts you, and every place he puts you shall prosper and shall be blessed. The nations belong to the Lord. It's very biblical to fight for our country. Now, the rooted injustices and all the demonic things that are, <laughs> that are in our nation need to be torn down, right? <clears throat> they need to be torn down. And so we fight to, to tear down injustices. So I want to see justice come where there's injustice. The second thing is that we need to see and understand that the minute you make a decision, first off, the minute you make a decision to even come to a church like this, you don't come here by accident. I just want you to know that. Yeah. And you don't stay by accident. This church, because of the nature of who we are on an apostolic dynamic, the move of the spirit, the intentionality, the, just the things I do. If you come together with me, I'm on the Ethics Commission, very active in this community, and we build relationships with a lot of key people so that they would get born again. And so when you make a decision any time in your life to move forward with the things of God, the devil's going to do all he can to knock you back. Right. I want you to know that. Right. If you've been battling addiction, the minute you make a decision to get healthy and especially throw God in the mix, is the minute that the enemy will do all he can right. to keep you back right. from moving in God's direction. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 13. So what Nehemiah does is he goes out by night. And, and I find this very interesting, and I don't have time to fully teach you on this, but I want you to see the first place that Nehemiah goes. I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse or dung or poop gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned by fire. You see, when God comes to transform your life, yeah, you get the joy of your salvation, but there's also the need to flip some tables in your heart. Think about it. When Jesus first returned back to the temple on the triumphant entry, riding on a donkey, what's the first place he went? To the temple. What's the first thing he did? Flip the tables. And so our prayer needs to be, God, if there's any injustice tables inside of me, flip them. Right? Because before the house can become a house of prayer or worship, we need to flip some tables. And you do not be afraid of that. You, in fact, it's way better to say, God, if there's any injustice or unbalanced scales inside of me, flip the tables. Flip the tables in my heart. We'll jump down to verse 17. Nehemiah had at this time determined, I'm summing up the, the, the story for you a little bit. Nehemiah had determined not to tell anyone what he was doing until the right time. You know, there's things that God can put inside of your heart that you're not supposed to be telling everybody else about. Because if it prematurely gets out there and the enemy hears about it, there's, God's got a perfect timing for everything. So some things are meant to be kept silent, not posted on Facebook. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. And so... Finally, Nehemiah tells the remnant, and he says, I said to them, you see, can't you see the distress that we're in? How Jerusalem lies waste, and, his gates are, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good to me, good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. And I love this. So guess what they said? Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. 
But here comes the enemy. When Sam Ballot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? And so here was Nehemiah's answer and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. And you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. That was powerful authority right there. Very powerful. You see, when God ordains something, he'll prosper you. When God, you know, I think about this. If you're a general contractor and you get a job by the federal government to build something, who pays for it? Don't say the taxpayers. I know the taxpayers pay for it. <laughs> I'm, but really, yeah, really, is the ta- it's you and me. But the funny thing is, is the federal government provides all the funding for it. Right. If you get a government contract from heaven, who pays for it? Come on, come on, that's good. Mm-hmm. Come on, get some faith in your life. Yeah. Stop living. This is that whole grasshopper mentality I talked about. Some of you are like, man, I look like a grasshopper. If you see yourself as rubbish, if you see yourself as a grasshopper, little old feeble me, little old wasted me, man, I don't see any of that. In fact, the way I see you is jewels in God's kingdom, gems and jewels. I see, and you know what? You may be surrounded by some clay and some coal, and you may be stuck in the ground right now, But you know what? I can see past that and I can see the pressure and the formation. You say, I'm manifesting in the devil. Pray for me, pastor. The devil's all around. I'm like, well, sounds like you're in a great spot. (laughs) Like, huh? Pray the devil away, pastor. Please pray the devil away. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'll pray for you to become who you're called to become because once you shut the flesh down and once you grow, the devil now has no more access and authority. The devil's already been defeated. The devil's already been defeated. So you're like, man, pray the loser defeated devil away. Uh, Let's jump over to chapter four. All these different people began building. The different tribes, the different leaders began building. Nehemiah chapter four, verse one. But so it happened when Sam Ballot heard that they were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant. Do you know that the Bible says that the devil, Revelation 12, is filled with rage and fury. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he knows his time is short. Because something's being built. I've got to see that. When they heard it, they were furious and indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Now, these are questions, and I'm going to answer them for you. Will they fortify themselves? What's the answer? Yes. Will they offer sacrifices? Yes. Will they complete it in a day? Well, it actually took 52 days, but it's going to happen fast. Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish of rubbish, stones that are burned. And I love this line. Bring the broken, bring the outcast. We got a word that Rock City Church is gonna be like a monastery. We have an option to buy some land in the bluff that was once a monastery. A monastery is a place where the broken and the outcast can come and find healing and solace and rest and peace with God. God is going to bring the broken, those that have been used and abused in the music, Christian music industry, those that have been used and abused in, as pastors or in Christianity altogether, those that are outcast burnt down, the addicts, the broken, the hurt, you name it. That's, that's what a house, this house is designed to do, is bring them and build them. Right? Bring them and build them. So the answer is yes. Nehemiah verse four, verse six, so we built the wall. And the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a what? We got to have a mind to work. It's never too late. I don't care how much you've worked before. I've been through bad church paradigms. I've been through bad church leadership. I've been through building campaigns. 
This isn't about just building a bigger building. This is about building a building of people and a house where the name of the Lord can be lifted up for all the nations to see the glory of the Lord, a family, a place where people can find healing, where kids can discover and grow in their gifts. And so what happened here was that all of the people of the region formed an army and plotted to come in the night to kill Nehemiah and the Israelites. And I want you to see what the response was. Nehemiah 4.16. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah, those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens, loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked a construction, and with the other hand they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Every single person plays a part. Every single person. We're diverse, but we're all called to have a sword, to know God's word, and to use it accurately. It's a double-edged sword. It can bring life or bring death, but it always conquers when used properly. It brings healing, it brings strength, it brings power, it sets captives free, and it also gives you incredible power and authority over the enemy. Remember, how did Jesus overcome the temptations and the lies of Satan? By every rhema spoken word of God that comes out of his mouth. One hand's on the wall building, one hand's ready at any time. Now, some of you will be a part in building some of you will be a part in worshiping and praying and interceding, right. but we all play a part. We all have a diverse, unique gift of different things that we can do, right? When I first got to Corpus Christi and I flew in the very first night ever, I had never seen Corpus Christi and I flew in at night on an American Eagle jet. It was prophetic. And as I flew in, it turned over the refineries and I noticed something very unique about the refineries. The lights on the refineries were different colored than the lights of the city. Now you say, well, that's not any big deal. It's like LED versus cool white. No. I'm listening to what God wants to say about this city that I'm coming in. And as I'm looking at the pure white, what seemed to me pure white light, I heard the Lord say, I'm about to refine my body. Amen. It's the first word I ever got when I got here. I'm about to refine my body. And then I went into a vision. And in the vision, I could see the city with broke, I could see tore down, broken down walls. And God began to speak to me about Nehemiah. And then I saw all the churches of the city. And around the churches were broken down walls. And God said, I've called you, son, to partner with my remnant here to rebuild the walls of my church in Nueces County. That's what I heard the Lord speak to me the day that I got here. And ever since then, I've been on a mission. The name of this church, the things we're involved in, how active we are, is all designed to bring unity to the body of Christ and to bring us together to build a wall, a wall of people, a family, a body that can grow into a spiritual house. That's the body of Christ. And that's the first word that I got. So God uses the rubbish God uses those who were once stoned to become wow. living stones. Let's everybody say it together. Say, I am, I am a living stone. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. What does it mean to be built up? To be built up means that pressure is creating us to be what we're called to be. The more pressure from the world around us, the more urgency inside of me. Pressure makes me more violent spiritually, more aggressive spiritually. Hurricanes, hardships, troubles, that doesn't make me shrink back. It makes me rise up more aggressively. And if you're frustrated by the things happening in the world around you, we have a responsibility to do something about it. So we're being built up. We're being re rebuilt, restored, repaired. We're being found. We're being established. We're being edified into a spiritual house. What is a spiritual house? A spiritual house, the word spiritual, pneumatikos, means pneuma or breath or wind driven. 
It means that we're not filled with formulas and corporate agendas. This is not an institution, it's a family. It's a place where those with institution pollution can come and finally say, man, and we're not the only ones. I'm not saying, man, I'm the only church in town. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying to you is that we're becoming something that I believe we all long for and desire to see, not because everyone else and everything else is broken, but because we see a pattern and we have a pattern from God to build something. And so we're building a spiritual house that eats from the tree of life, not behavior modification, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where we're just making good people. I don't want you to just be good people. I want you to be spiritual. I want you to be wind-driven. A spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices. Now let me say this to you. We did this building campaign two years ago. We raised $400,000 in a year. We used all that money, almost all that money, to rebuild, to rebuild, tear off a rusted roof and put a new roof on. Now I want to tell you something cool. How many of you know, if you weren't here at last service, what the very first gate that they hung at Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day, what was the name of the first gate? The sheep gate. The sheep gate. Do you know what the name of the second gate was? The fish gate. Now, for me, that's very prophetic. I mean, how do you, let's, the first one is, if you, Jesus says to Peter, if you love me, so God is taking care of this family for our family, right? Like God builds the sheep gates Why? So that when the fish come in through the fish gate, you see it? You're a a fish gate guy, Oscar. You and your wife will be sitting at the fish gate. I I know it. I see it. And there's there's eight other gates. But God's saying, I'm going to take care of you so that when the fish come, they have a gate to come through and a place, a habitation, a resting place. You should find rest when you're here. You shouldn't feel any weird religious thing when you come here. It should be healthy. It should be whole. And we're being built into something. We're living stones being built into something. I'm going to finish with these two points. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So we're all a part of a family. We're all a part of a household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, we are an apostolic prophetic church first. Jesus Christ himself being built upon the rock of Christ, who is the what? The chief cornerstone. It's church lordship. It's I want what God wants. And it may look wild and it may seem crazy. In fact, we don't even know what it's, we may not even know what's about to come but I want to make a space and a place for it. Now look at this in verse 21. In whom the whole what? Verse 21. It's coming, 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 taking its time. I'll just read it to you. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So we're being built into a building. So if people say, we are the church, we are the building, that's true. But God also builds a household. God also builds, and actually, if you look up the word building, it means a place where people can be trained and equipped and taught to become and to have wisdom and to learn what healthy looks like. That's why we're starting the school. There's got to be training. That's why we have redeemed, a place where people can come and find a family in recovery. That's why we have flourish. It's why we have men of valor. So we, are, we do a lot of things designed not to just have more meetings. Nobody needs more meetings. Right. Jesus didn't say, I have come that you would have more meetings and more meetings thereof. That's not what he said. <laughs> so, so we're not just doing meetings for meetings. What we're doing is connecting to build. He builds you to build. He builds you to build. 
So Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We're a building that's being fitted together. I really love that, being fitted together. Let's just th- meditate on that moment. I don't, get to say, I don't get to say, I don't like you. I don't get to say, I don't like you. Now, I may not like things you've done, and there may be things about you that I don't like, but I have to learn to love you and see you the way Jesus sees you. Why? Because I'm being fit together. You know, I, we, uh, another pastor and I kind of helped to loosely orchestrate a pastor's council in this city at the beginning of COVID. There's some pastors in that group that in the natural, I would never get along with. We're like oil and water. But you know what? We've grown to love each other. And they have different, do- I mean, some of these pastors don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they think praying in tongues is crazy, and we're high-fiving and hugging and doing lunch together and hanging out and getting along. In my early days, when I first came to know the Lord and filled with the Spirit, I would have ripped them to shreds and said, you're crazy, and I could never. That's my issue. God shifted my heart. And so now I can be with people that maybe don't think the way that I think and don't see the way that I see. Because why? Look at the Scripture. He's fitting us together, no matter our differences. And to make this point, I want you to look at this from King David's life. See, King David didn't get to build the temple. His son did. He really wanted to. In 2 Samuel 7, he's sitting in a palace, and he says, look, the Lord's in a little tent. Here I am in a palace. This is, this is not good. I'm going to build God a house. And then the Lord, through Nathan the prophet, comes back. First, the the seer, the prophet, misses it. He's like, whatever's in your heart, do. And then God deals with him that night. And then he comes back. and And here's the paraphrase of the chapter. This is what God says. I'm gonna paraphrase it for you. You think you're gonna build me a house? Don't you think... If I would have wanted one built by man, I would have had one built by now. See, the funny thing is, is we think we're going to build God a house. We're not building God a house. He's building us one. And it's for a lot of great purposes. God, see, God builds you a house. Psalm 18. We got some land in the bluff, and it's miraculous. We're not loaded with wealth and money the way by the world standards. In the natural, we never could have got this land, and it was pre-COVID, thank God. But God God gave me a scripture and really gave gave the whole thing to my wife first because I didn't have the faith for it. She did, and then God spoke to me, and then when it happened, I was pinching myself, and God's like, oh, Psalm 18, the Lord brought me into a broad place. He brings you into a broad place. Why? Because he delights in you. Oh, you didn't earn it, and you didn't deserve it. Oh, you think, but I'm rubbish, I'm feeble, I'm burnt down. God loved you the whole time. When you staggered out of that bar at 2 a.m., when you slept with who knows who and you don't remember their name, when you were seemingly left abandoned and abused by your family, God was there every step of the way. In fact, he actually never left you. He cried and wept with you. But if you respond right, your pain and your hurts become your testimony to help the next person in the same pain and hurt because there's the same you. There's a David Bendette living just like I live, tripping acid, eating mushrooms, getting high and sleeping around and miserable with a hole in his heart everywhere around me. And there's another Matt and there's another Rebecca. There's another Samira. There's another Brandon. There's another you. There's thousands and thousands of people just like you living the way that you once lived. And we have a call. And God's going to divinely orchestrate it. God's going to bring them. But we have to see them as gems and jewels and living stones in the kingdom. We can't see them as rubbish and waste places. We can't see them as, and you know the feeble thing? God uses the feeble things of this world. Say, I'm so weak, little old me. Yeah, little old you is the one that God can use the most because you're so bad that if God does it, it could have only been God. That's the beauty of it, right? Do you see that? 
You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. But David gets the plans. He's going to give it to his son. But not only did David get the plans, look at this. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 2. Now, this, this is David talking. This is King David. Now, for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might. I am at an all my might stage, shows my wife. We're literally in an all our might mode right now. The sacrifices, but we can't not. And look what he says. I prepare with all my might gold for the things of gold, silver for the things of silver, bronze. Now this is y'all, watch this. Bronze for the things of bronze, iron for things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and more slabs in abundance. David gained from his own treasury, 1 Chronicles 29, 8, and whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hand of Yehiel, the Gershonite. You know who he was? He was one of David's chief musicians. He was a Levite, a musician in charge of the money. That's a scary thought. (laughs) But he was a Levite because David gave to what mattered the most. This is going to be a house of prayer and a house of worship. I want you to understand that. God put me on hold for a couple years because I didn't want my heart to be wrong in building out this next sanctuary. I didn't want to do it for any selfish gain. I'm not doing it because I want a bigger church. <clears throat> and I've had my own mega church issues that I got corrected on. I said to Prophet Kevin Leal, I said, I only, want three, I only need 300 on fire people. He's like, dude, you got mega church issues. I said, yeah, it's institutionalized. He goes, bro, If you do the kingdom right, why wouldn't it grow? I said, okay, you're right. And so God dealt with me. I was sitting in Hotel Emma. It was prophetic because I had a dream about Emma. I was sitting in the Hotel Emma in San Antonio at the the hotel bar. Now, it was 9 o'clock in the morning and the bar was not open. And I was in there weeping and crying before a giant fireplace. This was early this year. Or actually, it was last year. And God said, God began to deal with me and had me read the whole story of Solomon and why Solomon built the temple. And he built it so that the name of the Lord could be known to all the nations and people could come and see, pray to it, worship in it, and the glory of God would be magnified all over the world. It was a house of prayer and a house of worship first. And may we never lose sight of that. And so now's the time. Now's the time. And I'm going to ask all of you to pray and consider right now making a contribution, a pledge for one year. I'm asking for 300 people to give $300 a month. And for some of you, I understand $300 a month seems like a lot of money. I get it in your situation, but what I want to tell you is it's not a lot of money. Okay, make a sacrifice, what something, even if it's five dollars, ten dollars, or maybe it's maybe it's half the amount. And you can partner up with other people too. And everybody was given this little square card, and we're asking everybody today to make a contribution or a pledge and a commitment for just one year. And in one year we can get that thing built out. Some of you will come pray, some of you will be over there working, you'll use your skills. Some of you will be warfaring, and some of you will just worship and agree. You know, we sang, the walls are coming down on that, against that wall, and guess what? Right after we warfared, when we did this before, the walls came down, and we built three classrooms. Right. Now God's saying, move to the next thing. So let me tell you what we're going to build. One of the most important things that excites me about the build-out is the fact that we're going to build six new children's classrooms, and we're going to shrink this down. We're going to build six classrooms in here and more over some over there conference rooms prayer rooms training rooms uh, a nursing mom's room with a window where they can see into the to the sanctuary but in here what we pioneered in here will be handed to the high school and junior high ministry it'll seat about 100 high school kids and we have some incredible inroads right now into flower bluff high school now i want to see all the corpus christi rock but i'm telling you god wants to do something at flower bluff high school and that city's going to get this, this city and this community and that school 
is going to get rocked, and I'm telling you they're going to come. We're partnering up with some great ministries that are already making inroads into the families of this community. And so my heart is to build a place where the youth can come and, the, and they can experience the revival. In fact, they can take it all over for all I care. I don't ever want it to be like the little service and the big service. And Francisco's coming on full time on the 13th, our youth pastor, and he's going to take our, our youth ministry to the next level. And I'm excited about that. So we're going to give, we're going to build more kids. We're going to build for the youth. And then we're going to build a state of the art worship and recording studio so that we can capture the prophetic worship. I'm not talking about nice contemporary Christian music. I'm talking about the prophetic sound that's going to come out of this house needs to be captured. And there's more that God's going to be bringing. Remember the monastery, healing, transformation, rest. And it's going to give us a greater influence to, to have more things to do in the city. Like right now, we are seriously, seriously consider going after this nine acres of land in the bluff. You say, well, pastor, you're about to build out a sanctuary. Okay. And it seems crazy in the natural, but God is a great big God. And so this church is going to make a huge difference in this community. And it may be stuff that's done long after we're here. But I'm thinking, I better leave our kids a lot of great things to put their hand to the plow on. And so I'm asking you all today to pray. Now, I want to tell you something about the, the amount. Almost now, really about 99% of the time, when God asks me to give something, I get the number instantly. And this isn't a pressure tactic. I'm just telling you, whatever the number is. So many times when Marlene and I are, Pastor Marlene and I are considering benevolence to help somebody, I'll get a number and I'll say to her, what do you think about this number? She goes, or what do you, I say to her, what number are you thinking? She says the number I'm thinking. That happens all the time with my wife and I. Many times I just get the numbers, 200, 300, 500, whatever it is. What I want to say to you is trust God. God can do it. Now we're not going to be checking the list twice. Nobody's going to be calling you saying, hey, you didn't give your pledge. Nobody, we're not doing any of that. We're not tracking, we're not even going to be tracking individual givers. This is between you and the Lord. We'll be tracking total amounts because we got work to do. But I'm not going to be saying, oh man, you said you would. There's none of that here. I'm asking you to make the commitment because it's, a, it's you saying yes. And ask the Lord what he wants you to do. Ask the Lord what he wants you to do. All right? It's going to be awesome. And we're building into something we own. Isn't that even cooler? Like, you're sitting on land owned by God. No, not one man can lay claim to it. Rock City Church owns this whole shopping center. Isn't that awesome? All right, so we're going to pray. And I want you to ask the Lord. I'm asking you to make a pledge and a commitment today. Now, you can do this with the card today. Yes, you can for sure take it home and pray over it. And you can also, in the drop-down menu on PushPay, on our app or on our website, you can actually go right to our giving tab and give right from there. All right? Let's pray. Lord, you said if we only believe... All things are possible. All things are possible. And Lord, so many lives here were burnt down stones that are now living stones. And God, there's so many more living stones that need to get in here. Lord, I thank you that we're built and hooked to the cornerstone and that it's just brick by brick, stone by stone. God, the names of the 12 tribes are written on the, pearl, the gates of pearl and in the foundations are written the names of your people. Our names are written in the foundations of the new Jerusalem. God, I just thank you that we're being fitted together, fitted. And anything that is unfit, Lord, size us up and fit us together into a, a building that's not built by hands but built by you 
And Lord, we pray that our hearts would be pure with all of our might and that you would give us a heart to work, a heart to do our parts. Lord, to see this next season come to fruition. A house of worship, a house of prosperity, where people that were once desolate, that were once broken and outcasts, can come into the fullness of your kingdom. And I thank you, Lord, that you're doing something awesome here in everybody's life. For those of you that have felt like you're so feeble, well, God uses the feeble things of this world. For those of you that, have, that you feel like your life is rubbish, well, God uses people just like you and turns you into something so beautiful and brilliant. God, unify us in our diversity, all the different stones in this place. It's a house of living stones hooked to the chief cornerstone. So God, I thank you. I thank you that more than enough is gonna come in to build what you've called us to build. And I thank you, God, for speaking to everybody here about what their part is, not just even in the finances, but Lord, in the labor and the work and the prayer the serving and the giving, the tending and the feeding. The tending and the feeding. God, sheep and lambs. So I bless you all mightily. I pray, God, that you'd cover and protect everyone here. Make your face to shine upon them so that their face would shine. Hedge them in, keep them, and protect them. Protect them from all the temptation. Deliver them away out of the temptation. And I thank you, God, for this family, this church, our city, from Flower Bluff to all the corners of Nueces County. Thank you, God, that the body of Christ Texas is ripe for true revival. All the other churches, all the other believers that are hungry and thirsty, all the other pastors, Lord, let your love and your power and your revival hit their hearts and their churches. And I thank you for that and that it's happening here. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.